Uh, I'm David, CEO and co-founder of Capacity. Today we're here to talk about how I raised $62 million without giving up a single vote. Now, is anyone out here raising capital right now? Anyone? Keep your hand up if you feel like this. Right? Raising capital is hard in general. When you're raising capital in the middle of a recessionary environment, it can be, you feel like you're drowning. It's so painful, it's so challenging. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, part one, we're gonna dissect the typical capital raise. Things that we want to unlearn that we may have seen that we see other people doing. Part two, we're gonna go to an unlikely source for some inspiration on how to raise your capital and something I actually applied to my last four rounds here at Capacity. And then part three, we're gonna give you an opportunity to go put this stuff to use. Sound like a good plan? Excellent. All right, so if you think about the typical capital raise, number one, it's never anyone's full-time job. A lot of times the CEO's got 10 other things going on, they're spending 9% of their time raising capital, uh, and so it doesn't get the love and attention it needs. Second thing is you've got CEOs reading off slides, they don't have their material down, they're talking with a small group of investors, a couple of folks who maybe came inbound uh, to go raise their next round. Uh, they're actually not putting any of their own capital in themselves, and they're spending a lot of time with individual parties. And I'll, we'll talk about this in a few slides, but a lot, a lot of time with someone that might not even transact. Uh, they're not creating FOMO. There's no fear of missing out on what could happen if they didn't invest. And uh, you've got a scattered presentation that's talking about a lot of different things. It's not focused, it's not zoomed in. And you've got people who just give up way too easily. And they end up taking the terms that happen on the other end. So what I thought we would do today is we're gonna go uh, figure out how to undo this. We're gonna go to this unlikely source of inspiration, but to get there, we're all gonna need to jump into our collective DeLoreans, and we're gonna need to go back in time, all the way to the year 1992. Now, I tried to find some of 1992's finest moments. Uh, you got Michael Jordan going for uh, NBA title. You got the Super Nintendo debuting. Uh, Batman Returns was hot at the box office. Big fan of uh, Michael Keaton there. Uh, the TI-85 came out, Windows 3.1. Uh, Crystal Clear Pepsi, anybody remember that? I thought that was, was kind of a fun five minute product. Uh, the X-Men animated series I was a big fan of. Uh, FUBU debuted in 1992. And then before uh, Aladdin, big, big movie. And then before there was ever a uh, Bill Nye, there was Beekman's World, uh, where Bill Nye was the, actually the assistant. So now that we're in full 1992 mindset, uh, that unlikely source of inspiration that we're gonna talk about is actually the Cub Scouts. Is it, was anyone here in Boy Scouts, Girl Scout, kind of scouting organization, right? Uh, so I went into the archives and I found this. Uh, this, this was me uh, over here. Uh, second from the right, you can tell I'm really enjoying myself uh, in this picture. Honestly, guys, I wasn't a great scout. Uh, I wasn't good at tying knots. I didn't really learn how to tie my shoes until almost the third grade. I still, my, my wife got me these shoes for my birthday, but I still prefer shoes without laces if I, I can. Uh, so I couldn't get the knot badges. Uh, when it comes to outdoorsy things, my dad isn't an outdoorsy guy. I'm not super outdoorsy. Had an idea that the tent would look like this, ends up looking more like that, extra poles, things leaning over. And then even when I did earn the badges and the patches, I didn't sew, my mom didn't sew, and so we were constantly ironing them on, which means I would show up to these Cub Scout events with the badges falling off. Uh, so again, not a great Cub Scout, with one exception. There was one thing we had to do in the scouting program that changed the course of my life. It was capital raising. Now, it looked a little different then. Uh, we didn't have the eponymous cookies that the, uh, our sisters of the Girl Scouts got to go sell. Uh, we had uh, pounds and pounds of candy, lots of sugar to sell to 1992's finest children to go raise capital for our troop. Now, in that case, the big uh, win at the end wasn't a venture exit or some big write-up in TechCrunch. It was the fidget spinner of its day. Anybody remember these? For these little, these little click, click clacker toys. Here, uh, you look like you could maybe enjoy one of these. Thank you. I've got a couple more of these at our booth, uh, booth a little later on. Uh, but this was the big win. If you, if you sold the most candy, you would get a bag of these click clacker toys, which was very motivating for a nine-year-old. 
All right, so how, David, what does the Cub Scouts have to do with raising capital for my startup? How do I link those two together? What are you talking about, man? So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna flip the script on the typical capital raise. We're gonna walk through how the Cub Scout selling model is an inspiration for how we raise four rounds. Uh, so a little bit about my company capacity. We are a support automation platform. Our mission is to help teams do their best work by automating as much of your support as possible, either for your team or for your customers. Now, we couldn't do our mission of helping teams do their best work if we couldn't do our best work. And we can't do our best work if we are not funded. And so we had to figure out how are we going to go fund this company, but how can we do it in a way where we can maintain some control, where we don't have to give up a bunch of votes? How can we do it so that we don't have outside forces dictating when we have to sell? What would that look like? Uh, so if you think of the typical capital raise, you typically have companies that are term takers. Go out to the market, hear some terms, take the best term that comes back from a small number of investors. We said, what if we could do an atypical capital raise? What if we could be term makers where we went in and said, we're gonna set these terms uh, and just work with the folks that want to get on board. Uh, that means, meant the byproduct of that is that we were gonna have to spend a lot of time with a large number of investors rather than uh, a lot of time with a small number of investors. So first off, we made this full-time job. Uh, I have a great chief revenue officer. I've got a great CFO. I have an awesome EA here. Uh, so I was not able to uh, give up the reins uh, of the company while doing this capital raise without having a great group. Similarly, when I was, when I was a kid, uh, as soon as I got home, uh, the first thing I did was get on my bike and start peddling this candy, right? So the very same kind of process. You wanna make this your full-time job. It's the one thing you are doing. If you're gonna go out and raise capital from a number of investors in smaller dollar amounts, you've gotta clear the calendar and say, this is what I'm doing until we got the dollars in the bank. Uh, second thing you gotta do is you gotta nail your pitch. Now, it was a lot easier pitch to sell the candy. Hi, I'm David, I'm from Troop you know, XYZ. Here's candy, you like candy, buy my candy, right? Uh, so I worked on that pitch over and over again. Uh, and at the same time, when it came to raising capital for capacity, we practiced that pitch about 100 times before we ever went out and met with any companies. So this is not something where you go out and you practice it once or twice. You need to get your pitch down and then course correct as you start getting the feedback along the way. Now, when I was out raising uh, capital for the Cub Scout troop, I had a list of all my friends and where they lived in the adjoining neighborhoods. And it was very important because some of my friends lived in the same neighborhood and I, I could walk there. And some of them lived a couple neighborhoods away and I didn't know everyone who lived on those streets. So I would often ask those kids, Is, are there any other kids on your street that might be interested in buying some candy? And so those second degree connections ended up being so important. So your initial list is important. Who are you gonna go out and talk with? But it's actually those second degree connections, the connections one, you know, one degree away from the people you know, who ended up driving a significant portion of our capital raise. Uh, skin in the game. So uh, confession, I did buy a couple dollars worth of candy when I was selling it. Uh, that way I could taste it. And when somebody asked me, David, which one should I get? I could say, well, you know, I had uh, Reese's yesterday. Yeah, you, should, you should really check that out. Uh, uh, similarly, in doing the capital rounds uh, for capacity, I invested in every single round. I'm a serial entrepreneur and I have the, uh, been blessed enough to be able to do that. Not everybody's in a financial position to do that. But even if you can put a little something in each round, then when you look the investor in the eye, you can say the same terms that you're raising and you're putting your money in, I'm putting my money in on the same way. Might not be to the same amount, might not be to the same degree, but it levels the playing field because you're no longer in an adversarial position with your investor. You're saying, look, I'm gonna put my own money in on these same terms. All right, the fifth lesson that we learned is the non-lingering lesson. Now, you can get to a door and somebody wants to talk and they wanna chat about this or that, or maybe it's a friend who's, all, oh, they're also selling candy, okay, well, we're hanging out. But the trick was you do not want to linger. You have daylight, you have to break because before uh, it's time for dinner and your, your candy sales stop, right? Uh, similarly, 
a lot of entrepreneurs end up spending a lot of time with investors who are never, ever going to put money into their company. Uh, my last company, when we didn't use this strategy, we met on average with about seven, seven meetings per uh, prospective investor. With capacity, we did it in a meeting and a half. So if we didn't know if you were interested in two meetings, you're probably not gonna, not gonna make it. Now you have to have the confidence to be able to look someone in the eye and say, look, if this is not for you, we are moving on. Uh, but that confidence actually uh, paradoxically gets people more interested and more uh, able to lean in. Uh, creating some FOMO. I mentioned, I kind of alluded, this to, uh, alluded, alluded to this a little earlier. Uh, it's one thing to have candy, but if you're selling it door to door, you actually want to open one up so a kid can see it. Maybe a little brother comes by. Oh, wow, that looks great. Maybe a little, little wrappers left around. You want to create that FOMO, that fear of missing out, and you want to make that as uh, tantalizing as possible. When it came to selling capacity, we did this in two ways. Uh, one, we focus heavily on the stats, on the ROI and the value we're delivering. So it's not like you're investing in an idea. We were able to show, hey, if you go put your money into this company, we are going to move the needle for our customers. Similarly, when it came to selling in the AI space, I can look people in the eye and say, I truly believe that artificial intelligence is going to be the defining technology of our century. Time to get on board. And that was very impactful, particularly early on when AI was just for, first starting to uh, bubble up into our collective, uh, collective conscious. Uh, also alluded to this earlier, you want to lead with your best. A lot of entrepreneurs start out their capital raising process with the equivalent of candy corn that they're trying to peddle. Now, maybe, you, is anybody here like candy corn? No, nobody liked it. Really? Wow, that's, a, that's impressive. That's impressive. Uh, for us, there were three types of candy, right? There's regular candy, there's Reese's peanut butter cup, and then there's the king size Reese's peanut butter cup. Four peanut butter cups in one, right? This was the best. If I got that king size Reese's peanut butter cup, I could land a sale significant amount of the time, more, probably 50% plus if a kid was involved. Uh, so when I went out to go try to raise capital, the thing I wanted to distill was what was the best essence of the demo of what we did. Not the 30 minute demo, not the hour demo, not the, not the deep dive. If I was gonna explain what we did to help companies do their best work in the shortest possible time, the best way, what would that look like? So for us, we went through all our different demos and the one that was salient that everyone could relate to is around the PTO process. Think about trying to apply for PTO in a lot of organizations. You gotta go log into ADP, you forget your password, you gotta go talk with someone in HR. It's this big muddled mess with capacity. You ask how many vacation days do I have? The AI comes back instantly with a response. Everyone could very quickly get grasp that what we're trying to do is help teams do their best work, making all of your intelligence accessible. It's just a very simple, distilled way of delivering the value problem. So I would ask you all, when you're out raising capital, what is the easiest, freshest way to distill down what you're trying to do, uh, down to even one simple use case? Keep going through the rain. Now, a lot of kids, I, I, grew, I grew up in St. Louis, uh, and you know we get rain from time to time, particularly in the, in the fall. A lot of kids would stop selling in the rain. Now, the truth is, if you're selling candy to kids, Kids don't care if it's raining. They don't mind. But if you're selling candy to adults, paradoxically, adults will actually give you more money when you're selling in the rain. If you show up, you know, normal with your box of candy and your troop, you know, they might, they might shell something out. But if you're sopping wet and you're in your raincoat and your galoshes and you look a little disheveled, they'll actually, they'll actually give you a little bit more money uh, because they, they're like, wow, this kid is out hustling. I want to go support them. The reason I bring this up is obviously we are heading into in a lot of uncertainty in our economic environment. Uh, but I want to I want to point out Microsoft, Netflix, Disney, some of the greatest companies in the world were started in the middle of a recession. And so if you're worried about the macroeconomic climate for raising capital. I would argue there is never a better time than when people don't know where to put their money, particularly in the public markets. So if I was gonna recap uh, this journey, 
found a full-time job selling candy, selling cap, uh, raising capital for my company, nailing that pitch, making that list and getting those secondary, uh, second order connections out, going off and putting skin in the game so that I could look someone in the eye and say that if you invest in this company, uh, you're gonna do so on the same terms that I did. Not lingering, don't spend, don't spend too much time with folks uh, that aren't interested. Uh, being able to create that FOMO while at the same time leading with your best product in your pitch. And then uh, lastly, go, keep them going through the rain. Uh, some of the best companies are founded when uh, the skies look a little cloudy. Now, it's one thing for me to get up here and uh, deconstruct the typical, typical capital raise. It's also another thing for me to give you my cheesy 1992 references. But what I thought we could do is we're gonna make this a little fun. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through like, where we landed uh, from our like, actual numbers. Uh, we don't normally disclose this, but this is a Saster only uh, exclusive uh, presentation. Uh, but exactly like, like, David, what were the results of what happened here? So we ended up talking with, uh, or acquiring a list of 435 people. Uh, of the people we knew, I'm gonna say it was maybe about 100 of those. I would say the other 335 were second order connections that we met through people we knew. Of those friends and family, we had over 400 meetings across four rounds. Now the number of meetings uh, would vary depending on, are we raising seed capital, we need a little bit to get off the ground, or are we raising uh, series C and we're raising a much larger number. Uh, but point being, we had a lot of meetings uh, with folks. But going back to the earlier slide, we didn't meet with people, the, the same people over and over and over again. We typically met with them once or twice. Uh, out of those 435, we got 120 investors. So what does that mean? That means seven out of 10 of the people we thought could invest told us no, at a significant no rate. But because we built that list earlier, we were still able to get 120 investors and those 120 investors combined put in about 62.5 million into our company.